Luke chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So at the temple, Jesus noticed a long line of rich people who put in a lot of money, perhaps making some kind of a display to call attention to their gifts. And the line at the offering box and the pride shown by the rich men in their giving shows us that it isn't necessarily more spiritual to have an offering box instead of passing offering bags. It isn't a matter of right and wrong. It's a matter of which is an easier way for people to give in a way that doesn't call attention to their gifts. And so this poor widow must have been a welcome sight to a weary Jesus who endured a storm of question from his enemies. Uh, Jesus sees us when we give. He notices how much we give, but it's far more uh, he's far more interested in the faith and motive and heart in giving than simply just the amount. And so the value of a mite can be determined like this. A denarii is one day's wage and equals six mees. Uh, one me equals two pondians. And one pondian equals two isserines. And one isserine equals eight mites. And when you figure it all out... Two mites is about 1% of a denarii, which is 1% of a day's wage. And so the ancient Greek word lepton literally means a tiny thing. And so in the Old English, it's translated mite, which comes from the word for crumb or a very small morsel. So she gave two mites, not just one. Uh, the widow might have kept one coin for herself, and no one would blame her if she did. Giving one meant giving half of all of her money. Instead, she gave with staggering generosity. Verses 3 and 4. So he said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these, out of their abundance, have put in offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. So Jesus did not say that she put in more than any one of them. He said that she put in more than all of them, all of them put together. The others gave out of their abundance. She gave sacrificially out of her poverty. So Jesus' principle here shows us that before God, the spirit behind giving determines the value of the gift much more than the amount. God doesn't want grudgingly given money or guilt money. God loves a cheerful giver as Corinthians will tell us. And so the widow's gift and Jesus' comment on it also shows us that the value of the gift is determined by what it cost the giver. This is what made the widow's gift so valuable. Uh, in Second Samuel 24, verse 24, David refused to give God that which cost me nothing. So Jesus' principle here shows us that God does not need our money. If God needed our money, then how much we give would be way more important than our heart in giving. Instead, it's our privilege to give to him. It's already his. We're stewards. And we need to give because it's good for us, not because it's good for God. You can't add to God. He's already complete. And so the woman was poor because she was a widow and had no husband to help support her. It also may be significant that Jesus had just criticized, uh, criticized the scribes as those who devour widows' houses in Luke chapter 20, verse 47. Then a lone widow made a spectacular contribution here, and perhaps a scribe devoured her house. Verse 5 and 6. Then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, These things which you see, the days will come, in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So this temple was originally rebuilt by Zerubbabel and Ezra in Ezra chapter 6 verse 15, but it was greatly expanded and improved by Herod. It was the center of Jewish life for almost a thousand years. The temple was so revered that it was customary to swear by the temple in Matthew 23 verse 16. And speaking against the temple could be considered blasphemy in Acts chapter 6, verse 13. And King Herod more than doubled the Temple Mount area, increasing it to about 36 acres or 150,000 um, square meters. Uh, Herod's rebuilding work started in 19 BC and was only completed in uh, 63 AD, uh, taking more than 80 years. And it was finished only seven years before it was destroyed. 
And so the temple wasn't just big, it was also beautiful. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus said that the temple was covered on the outside with gold plates that were so brilliant that when the sun shone on them, it was blinding to look at. Uh, where there was no gold, there were blocks of marble of such a pure white that from a distance, uh, travelers actually thought that there was snow on the Temple Mount. And so as great as the temple was, Jesus never hesitated to claim that he was greater than the temple in Matthew 12 or 6. Uh, for many Jews of that day, the temple had become an idol. It began to mean more to the people than God himself did. So good things can become the worst idols, and perhaps God sours or takes away even good things that we make our idols. And so some 40 years after Jesus said this, there was a widespread Jewish revolution against the Romans in Palestine. The rebels enjoyed many early successes, but ultimately Rome crushed the rebellion. Jerusalem was leveled, including the temple, just as Jesus said. And it said that at the fall of Jerusalem, the last surviving Jews of the city fled to the temple because it was the strongest, most secure building in that city. The Roman soldiers surrounded it, and one drunk soldier started a fire that soon engulfed the whole building. Ornate gold detail work on the roof melted down in the cracks between the stone walls of the temple, and to retrieve that gold, the Roman commander ordered that the temple be dismantled stone by stone. So the destruction was so complete that today there is true difficulty learning exactly where that temple was. Verse 7. So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? So astounded by the prediction of Jesus, the disciples ask a logical question, and this question begins one of Jesus' most famous teachings, often called the Olivet Discourse, because Matthew 24, verse 3 tells us Jesus said these things seated on the Mount of Olives. Matthew 24 seems to have a more complete account of this teaching. It's helpful to answer questions about the Luke account from a more complete recording in Matthew. And both Matthew and Luke make it clear that Jesus spoke both of the coming destruction of Jerusalem and of the ultimate end of the age and his glorious return. So prophetically, the two here are connected, though separated by many centuries. And so the reply of Jesus to these questions recorded in both 20, uh, Matthew 24 and here in Luke 21 has in mind both the coming destruction to come upon Jerusalem in the near term and in the ultimate return of Jesus at the end of the age. Luke's record focuses more on the first aspect. Matthew recorded the much more specific answer to the following question, pointing to what Jesus called the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, verse 15 and following. All right, Luke 21, verse 8. And he said, Take heed that you not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near, therefore do not go after them. So from the outset, Jesus warned the disciples that many would be deceived as they anticipated his return. There have been times in the history of the church when rash predictions were made and then relied upon, resulting in great disappointment, disillusionment, and falling away. And so Jesus knew that Many would come after him, claiming to be the political military messiah for Israel. One striking example of this was a man named Bar um, Kokhba, who a hundred years after Jesus, many Jews considered to be the messiah. He started a widespread revolution against the, revolu uh, the Romans and enjoyed an early success, but was soon crushed. And tragically, those who rejected Jesus when he came to them as Messiah ended up falling after false messiahs who led them into nothing but death and destruction. So in rejecting the truth, they were vulnerable to a greater deception. Verse 9 through 11. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first. But the end will not come immediately. Then he said to them, A nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. So what Jesus said here applied both to the coming destruction of Jerusalem and yet to be um, the fulfilled return of Jesus at the end of the age. And in some sense, there were wars um, 
preceding the destruction of Jerusalem because the Romans were frequently at war with the Jews, the Samaritans, the Syrians, and others during this period. Uh, in the broader Roman Empire, there were notable earthquakes before Jerusalem was destroyed. There were famines, such as the one mentioned in Acts chapter 11, verse 28. In the greater Roman Empire, there were fearful sites, such as the destruction of Pompeii, only seven years before Jerusalem was destroyed. And there were signs in the heavens, such as the comet that looked like a sword in the sky over Jerusalem before its destruction. And so yet, Jesus specifically said that none of these things are the specific signs of his immediate coming. Matthew 24 verse 8 described these things as the beginning of sorrows, more literally the beginning of labor pains. Uh, just as is true with labor pains, we should expect that the things mentioned, wars, famines, and earthquakes, and so forth, would become more frequent and more intense before the return of Jesus, without any one of them being the specific sign of the end. And so these things must happen because they are part of the prophetic program of the end time in general and so are divinely decreed thus. Uh, but they do not usher in the immediate end. The fall of Jerusalem and events leading up to it were morally, though not chronologically, of a eschatological character all right verse 12 through 15 but before all these things they will lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons you will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony therefore settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer for i will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist so this was and is true both of the time preceding the destruction of Jerusalem and the time preceding the ultimate return of Jesus in glory. Disciples will be persecuted, but they must not regard any reason of uh, any season of such suffering, uh, no matter how severe as this specific sign of the end. So this is going indicate, to indicate uh, persecution from both religious and secular sources, uh, delivering you up to synagogues and prisons. Disciples of Jesus must expect both. And from the book of Acts on, there have been countless times when persecution has given Christians the opportunity to preach and give testimony to those they could otherwise never reach with the message, such as kings and rulers. And so Jesus personally promised special grace, special help to his people in those circumstances. Verse 16 through 19, You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience possess your souls. So Christians must expect to suffer not only from enemies outside the church, but also from traitors among believers. Because of this, some would even die. And it's strange to think that men and women would be hated for the sake of Jesus, who was and is only love and goodness. Yet, of course, it's true. And the word for patience here is the Greek word... Um, Hupomone, uh, and I probably mispronounced that, and it speaks of a um, strong endurance, not a passive waiting. We endure, trusting the promise of Jesus that ultimately, in eternal perspective, not a hair of your head shall be lost. Verse 20 through 24. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be a great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. So this warning of Jesus focused on the near aspects of the greater prophecy were virtually ignored by the Jewish people in um, 70 AD when Roman armies circled Jerusalem. And many Jews expected the Messiah to return in glory when these hostile Gentile armies surrounded Jerusalem. However, 
Christians in Jerusalem knew what Jesus had said, and they obeyed him, and they fled across the Jordan River, mostly to Pella, and few, if any, Christians perished in the fall of Jerusalem. And so uh, an ancient Christian historian, um, Eusebius, wrote that Christians fled to Pella in response to an oracle given by Revelation in history of the church. Uh, The Roman conquest of Jerusalem in 70 AD was complete. Uh, History records that 1.1 million Jews were killed and another 97,000 were taken captive in one of the worst calamities ever to strike the Jewish people. Jesus warned them to avoid it. And when the Romans were done with Jerusalem in 70 AD, not a single Jew was left alive in the city. The Romans eventually renamed the city uh, Aelia Capitolina. And for many years, it would, be, it would not allow a Jew to even enter what was formerly known as Jerusalem, except on one day a year, the anniversary of the fall of the city and the destruction of the temple, when Jews were incited to come and mourn bitterly. So truly meant it when he said that these days, uh, these are the days of vengeance. And this is why he wept over Jerusalem in Luke 19, verses 41 through 44, because he could see the massive devastation to come upon his city that he loved, and why he warned all who would listen how they could flee from that coming destruction. Verse 24, And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So after the destruction of Jerusalem and the dispersion of the Jews predicted by Jesus in the previous verses, there would come a long period when Jerusalem would be dominated by Gentiles. And uh, after thousands of years of exile, a Jewish state was miraculously established in Israel again in 1948. Uh, It was not until 1968 that Israel controlled Jerusalem, but still today they yield the rule and the administration of the most central piece of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. To Gentile rule the Palestinian Authority. Uh, It can be argued that, prophetically speaking, Jerusalem is still trampled by Gentiles. And so when these times of the Gentiles are completed, the author believes that the remaining seven-year period appointed to the Jewish people in Daniel chapter 9 begins. The calamities described in the following verses will come in this period. And the Gentiles shall not always tread down Jerusalem. Verse 25 through 28. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So history records no adequate fulfillment of these words in 70 AD or immediately following. Uh, Jesus here looked to the later aspects of the ultimate fulfillment of his return and the end of the age. And this time, this kind of total chaos and calamity is described in horrific detail in Revelation chapter 6, 8, 9, and 15 through 18. Uh, All this will culminate in a dramatic, spectacular return of Jesus coming with his church to the earth. And again, history records no adequate fulfillment of these words in uh, 70 AD or immediately following. uh, Son of Man coming in the cloud with uh, power and great glory. Uh, Jesus has returned um, from describing events that have already happened from our perspective to describing events that have yet to happen. And so the things that will begin to happen are described in verse... 25 through 27. Uh, Jesus assured believers on the earth at that time to be ready because the time of great tribulation they experience will not last forever, but Jesus will return in glory soon. All right, verse 29 through 33. Then he spoke to them in a parable Look at that fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So the fig tree is just one example of a tree that buds before summer. No special reference to Israel seems to be intended, as indicated by the words, and all the trees. Uh, The idea is that when a fig tree buds, there's an inevitable result. Summer's near and fruit's coming. In the same way, when these signs are seen, the coming of Jesus in glory with his church to this world will inevitably follow. So Jesus did not refer to his own generation and that of the disciples, but of the generation that sees those signs. 
they will also see the very end. This is God's promise that he will not prolong what Jesus called the Great Tribulation in Matthew 24, verse 21, forever. Uh, there's also a strong case to be made that Jesus meant the Jewish people by the term this generation, meaning that they would not perish despite terrible persecution and attempted genocide until these things were fulfilled. And so the word genea can mean three things. One, the descendants of a common ancestor. Two, a set of people born at the same time. And three, a, the period of time occupied by s such a set of people, often in the sense of successive sets of people. It cannot be said, therefore, that genea necessarily means generation. And so no mere man could truthfully say this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will no me by no means pass away. Jesus claimed that his words were the very words of God, and they are. Verse 34 through 36. But, uh, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So we must take heed because there are certain things that will make one unprepared, like carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. Each of these things make us unprepared for the day of Jesus' return, and they make the heart weighed down. And carousing literally refers to the hangover that comes after a time of intoxication. Jesus here, I'll come as a snare, you know, it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. What Jesus is speaking of here, uh, he spoke of his coming from a different angle. In Luke 21, verse 25 through 26, he spoke of unmistakable calamity to shake the earth before the coming of Jesus. In verses 34 through 36, Jesus said that he would come as a surprise, a snare, and emphasized the importance of readiness. This is because the second coming of Jesus has two distinct, uh, distinct aspects, separated by an appreciable time. The first aspect comes suddenly, unexpectedly, as a snare in a time of peace and safety. The second comes with great anticipation to a world almost destroyed by the judgment of God, with Jesus coming to the earth with his people from heaven. So those who are ready for the first aspect of his coming would be counted worthy to escape all these things. Uh, the things of great calamity to come to the earth. They would instead stand before the Son of Man. Uh, these are those who are caught up together with Jesus to meet the Lord in the air in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, to escape the tribulation to come upon the earth. Uh, what, Jesus, what Jesus spoke of at this part of Luke's record of the Olivet Discourse applied to those of the whole earth, not only those who lived in Jerusalem or Judea. This speaks of much more than what happened in uh, to Jerusalem in 70 AD. So because this is relevant to the whole earth, we must watch. Anyone who watches will never be caught in a snare, and a failure to watch prevents us from being ready. So Jesus told his followers to pray always, that they may be found worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. The good news in Jesus is that we don't have to go through this calamity that's coming. He will take as many as are ready before this calamity begins. Uh, in a lesser and more immediate sense regarding the destruction of Jerusalem, those who listened to and obeyed Jesus escaped the horrible destruction that came upon the city. Regarding the far destruction that is coming upon the entire planet, uh, those who listen to and obey Jesus can escape the horrible destruction that will come ultimately. Verse 37 and 38. And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. So Luke emphasized the public, open character of Jesus' teaching work, even teaching early in the morning at the most public place in Jerusalem. Jesus did not hide in these few days before his betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion. He was hard at work. And like many Galileans who came to Jerusalem for Passover, Jesus essentially camped out on Mount Olivet in the days leading up to Passover.